warm greetings everyone on behalf of w4w foundation a think tank instituted as a citizen collective we welcome you to another session of wednesdays for water the conversation today is on understanding the emerging pollutants and their impacts especially we are going to look at the health impacts as i understand from the speakers Firstly, the objective of Wetness Days for Water is to engage in conversation with water experts, grassroots practitioners, policy makers, and youth to explore the complex and intertwined issues associated with water and the possible solutions all these water workers have been working and dedicating their life for. Wetness Days for Water has expanded since uh, three years now uh, to have more activities like Friday waters and Monday munching and musing with women for water. Besides organizing physical water workshops, water walks and talks, seminars, special courses and conferences and panels to continue the water conversation in various possible ways. In here, our major agenda is to make water conversations really crucial towards water conservation, as we call it, as our tagline. And the very essence and a genuine effort towards it is to really make water everybody's business. Please visit our website www.w4w.in for more details. My name is Mansi Bal Bhargav and I'm the moderator and host for the session today and representing W4W. Uh, today's session, as I mentioned, is on understanding the emerging pollutants and their impacts. I have just drawn a line from United Nations Environment Program to outline what is emerging pollutants because for me also it's a very new topic to really look at. And it gives me a really scary feeling. But let's try to understand because that may clear a little bit more fear from our you know, heads. So United Nations Environment Program defines emerging pollutants as the chemicals and compounds that have recently been identified as dangerous to the environment and consequently to the health of human beings. Precisely, they have been labeled as emerging because of the rising level of concern linked to them. To my personal little knowledge, I understand that the conventional pollutants which we know, we are already struggling with them. And uh, the just like them, the emerging pollutants are also broadly classified into biological or organic pollutants and inorganic like heavy metals and so on and so forth. I, my knowledge actually stops here and that's why we have today a, a wonderful experts to really talk about it and a young discussant. So we have Pallavi Kumar and Girja Bharat as speakers and Nathaniel Bhakupar Dakar. So I hope I have uh, really pronounced his name correctly and if not, please pardon me. I will prefer to call you as nuts and that will be a better <laughs> I think pronunciation as a friend. So um, I'm going to invite Girja first to uh, make her presentation and talk about it. But before that, a brief um, outline about her journey in this field. And otherwise, with the over three decades of experience in water resource management, water supply and sanitation, a good friend also, and a national council member from the Wiki Water Resource Council. She is the founder director of Mugama Consultants in, uh, based in Gurgaon. She has a long uh, career with a lot of publications and committees and scientific uh, uh, work in her background, which I'm going to put in the chat box and save the time to let her talk about her endeavors. And that way we can save some time. So Girja, I, over to you. And really thankful to you that you could really encourage to have this session with all of us. And looking forward to have your thoughts about the emerging pollutants. And I assume you are going to touch <clears> upon <throat> one of the sides of the pollutants and Pallavi is going to take the other side of it. Over to you. Thank you, Mansi. Thank you, everyone, for coming and participating in this uh, webinar. And I'm so thankful to W4W Foundation for organizing such interesting talks every week. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen. Um, sure. Yeah. So briefly about my journey, how it started. Uh, I started my journey on persistent organic pollutants in 2007 I, when I was a postdoc fellow. And since then, this has continued. And uh, uh, when I was, I came back to India, I thought this is a very strong gap area, which in India we are not uh, looking upon. We were in in 2009 and all, we were still grappling with uh, BOD, COD and uh, other physicochemical parameters of water and we were not concerned 
or probably not thoughtful about the presence of persistent organic pollutants, which were uh, an integral part of our daily living. And we were not aware of the health impacts. So since then, I have been working on this area and brought out many research studies. And from each of those research studies, we have collectively brought out several policy documents for the policymakers of India. And thankfully, I am seeing a lot of traction now in India. And uh, there is recognition of the presence of these emerging pollutants, which are persistent organic pollutants, endocrine disrupting chemicals, and uh, so on. So the outline of my talk will be basically on persistent organic pollutants. I will keep it very broad and very uh, easy to understand for people who, for whom this is a very new area of uh, knowledge. And I'll also be dwelling on the human health impacts and some case studies about this. Persistent organic pollutants are persistent. That means they're resistant to physical, chemical, and biological degradation. They are bioaccumulative because they can easily dissolve in fats. That, that means they're lipophilic and accumulate in the body tissue of living organisms in uh, to concentrations much higher than those in the surrounding environment. They are semi-volatile. They evaporate relatively slowly with warm air and travel long distance on air currents and return to earth with rain, snow, and colder regions. This is called the grasshopper level uh, effect because they evaporate from the hotter region to the colder region and get deposited. So as we discuss, I will be coming to that. And it is long range atmospheric transport because they travel long distance in the environment and they cause harmful uh, effects to human. It enters the food chain and it ultimately impacts human beings. So this is a conceptual model of how per, POPs, we call it POPs, persistent organic pollutants, how from atmospheric depositions, through rain it comes, from uh, releases from uh, different sources, agriculture releases, like pesticides, etc. They get transported to different matrices, water, soil, biota, air, and ultimately get circulated in the system. Many of our daily use products, which are used to improve the product characteristics, such as flame retardants or surfactants, are POPs. They biomagnify throughout food chain and bioaccumulate in organisms. And at low levels, very low levels, trace levels, POPs can lead to many health hazards, and they, such as they alter the immune system, there is cancer risk, reproductive disorder, new, uh, neurobehavioral uh, impairment, and genotoxicity, and increased birth defects. This is how it is, how it bioaccumulates from different organisms. As we reach the higher organisms, the, it keeps on accumulating. And this food chain, which shows that small amounts of contaminants consumed by simple organisms, which can end up being found at large concentrations at a larger organism through biomagnification. The effects, as I mentioned, they impact the reproductive organs, immune system, altered liver enzymes, increased risk of tumors, porphyria, and different mammals and other organisms, other living beings have different kinds of impact. Like the birds, for birds, the egg shell becomes thin. So the egg doesn't hold and the population of birds slowly declines. And for fish, the reproductive alteration takes place. So I have already mentioned these are the different health impacts. I'll not go into the details of it. But the timing of exposure of these POPs is very critical. During fetal programming, it is a permanent change. And if it is during adulthood, homeostasis, it compensates during different life stages, the impact is different. So the timing of exposure determines the type and severity of effect of these contaminants. PFAS is another class of POPs that is perfluoroalkyl substances. 
there are a group of manufactured chemicals used in industries and consumer products due to their useful properties. They are forever chemicals and they break down very slowly and build up in people, plants, animals, and the environment over time. There is a lot of interest and studies going on in on PFAS, and PFAS has been found in drinking water sources as well. PFAS, there are different categories of it, perfluoroactonic uh, octanoic acid, perfluorooctane sulfonate are two most widely used and studied PFAS. They are present in drinking water, soil, what waste for management uh, waste management sites fire extinguishing form etc and their impact is the impact reproductive effects have reproductive effects developmental effects increased risk of malignancies reduced ability of the body's immune system to fight infection and interfere with body's natural hormones increased cholesterol and risk of obesity and changes in liver enzyme. So different classes of PFAS has different impacts. It's very, very risky, and we are very unmindful of the presence of PFAS in our surroundings. So the risk of PFAS depends on the exposure factor, that is the dose, frequency, route, and duration. Individual factors like, like sensitivity and disease burden is also very important to important factor on the risk. Other health factors let it, such as access to safe water and quality health care are very important factors when it comes to risk of PFAS. I'll just briefly touch upon two case studies which we did. One was in Ganga. We collected samples from Gangotri to Ganga Sagar from different sources from the river Ganga, water, soil and also the rain water. We used a deposit meter and we collected from several upstream and downstream of several cities. And we saw that PFAS gets remobilized. That's the, uh, the glacier melt. The I had mentioned earlier that it pops is long range transport. So this, the glacier melt had on the upstream higher levels of these persistent organic pollutants. And in the, we also did this P, studies on PFAS in the same uh, research, and we saw that out of 21 analyzed samples, 15 were detected uh, with more or more with PFAS. And PFAS is basically carbon 5 to carbon 8 C, 5 to C, 8 chain. So detected more frequently, that means the shorter chain were detected more frequently than the long chain ones. And the concentrations measured downstream of the sampling sites were typically PFAS especially were higher than those measured upstream. And indication uh, presence of local sources in addition to atmospheric sources were there. And uh, we saw that, as I mentioned, short chain PFCA, they exceeded levels of PF PFAO. This is just a graph to show how at different locations groundwater, drinking water samples had PFAS, different categories of PFAS. And this will show us, it's quite scary that the ground, the river water and groundwater had very similar profile. If you see Kanpur, this belt, Varansi, Patna, they were very high on PFAS. Even the groundwater, the green line, you will see they were quite substantially high, much, much higher than the, the level to which it is assigned to. So we brought out several publications from this research. And we also brought out this policy brief so that the policy makers are aware of it. We also brought out the climate act, climate impact, climate induced mobilization of these persistent organic pollutants and were shared with the relevant policy makers for policy action. And the second one was when we collected samples from Tapi and Damanganga. Well, again, for the sake of time, I will not go into the details. Here also we collected samples from the uh, from Surat and uh, Wapi. And we did sample analysis of water, sediment, biota, and uh, soil. And the key findings we saw that samples of air, soil, sediment, cow's milk, and fish 
were analyzed and it showed the presence of several POPs, including those prohibited under the Stockholm Convention. The substances are used in agriculture, industry, and products, <clears throat> the later subsequently ending up in waste. The fluxes of plastics and microplastics were also mapped in this project through monitoring and laboratory analysis and modeling. And plastic waste management by informal sector waste workers in Surat and Wapi were studied. And the findings provide important knowledge to Indian authorities that is used to improve the quality of life of the informal sector recycling workers. And the knowledge from this project has helped Indian government, the center, as well as the state for science-informed policy decisions. These are some of the reports which we brought out. These are some of the books which we brought out on the subject. And uh, in conclusion, well, in India, we are also mindful of several contaminants, but we are taking action, though it is very slow. Our action is often in a retrospective manner, not a prospective manner. We need to change that stand. This time, the current economic development, India is also a hotspot for POPs and similar bioaccumulative hazardous pollutants, which needs an integrated regulation, regulatory approach for chemical pollution management. Special attention needs to be given to Himalayan glacier as our study shows, meltwater can be influential secondary source of polychlorinated biphenyls and other POPs, which are high molecular polyaromatic hydrocarbons and other bioaccumulative substances. And we need to have a basin scale management for Indian rivers. As the study shows, tight link between emission and exposure of PFAS and anthropic presence in a complex and heterogeneous basis. Basin of such as the Ganga River, and a large population might be at very high health risk as contaminants in surface water, receiving water, they directly influence the groundwater quality and we don't treat it, we consume it. So this relationship is demonstrated, you have seen in one of my slides. So with this, I end my presentation here and I'm open to discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gija. Thank you so much. And uh, if I was scared, it was rightfully so then. I mean, even if ignorant, but uh, when we uh, just read about it and not knowing so much, as you showed through uh, very simple examples, which are uh, understandable to common people like us, not knowing much about these things. Uh, and and I, we are going to talk about how do we get over it. But one graph, which was very, very interesting, and as well as as you mentioned that the, uh, the convergence of the quality of uh, surface water and groundwater is very much similar now. So the, our perception that groundwater is really something which we can just draw and use uh, will change over time if we people come to know about these things more often. So and that's the reason why we are organizing these conversations. So thank you so much. We come back to the questions uh, and um, answer session with uh, Nux, uh, with us. And all the participants here are encouraged to put their questions and comments in the chat box. And let me just now invite Pallavi Kumar without um, taking much time. But very brief one or two line bio before I invite her. So first of all, thank you, Pallavi, for taking out time for us and also showing interest to be part of uh, this water conversation community. With your 15 years of professional experience in reproductive and sexual health, maternal and child health, nutrition and gender, adolescent and youth empowerment, wash and community engagement, uh, I, I feel uh, you are uh, really going to throw a much deeper light on what's happening within our body with these water when we consume. But you have contributed uh, a lot in um, uh, many national and international organizations, including Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, United Nations, Population Fund, and as I mentioned, many more. And you have been working on some very important projects, um, and you are going to talk about it. And we are looking forward to listening more about these emerging pollutants. And I'm sure you are going to equally uh, press us to think more about them. Over to you, Pallavi. I'm going to put your details um, bio in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mansi, and thank you, uh, W for W Foundation, for this opportunity. And I'm very glad to be here uh, today. 
and uh, I will be sharing some of the insight on the emerging pollutant in context of the heavy metal contamination and its health impact. But before going into the um, topic, I would like to stretch a bit about myself and my organization and the project on which we are working. I'm a part of the Comprehensive Primary Healthcare Project. Uh, it's also the USAID Health System Strengthening Project. Uh, by name Nishtha, and it is implemented by Japaigo, uh, the organization uh, from which I belong. And we operate across 12 states of India, and we work closely with the national government and the state government uh, for operationalization, functionality of the comprehensive primary health care. So when I say uh, comprehensive primary health care, uh, you all know that unless and until we don't address the other social determinant of health, uh, just talking about health will not lead into anything. So this is the way our journey begin. Uh, while we were working on the health, uh, we also try to address other issues. And intersectoral collaboration is one of the uh, biggest component on which we focus at the primary health care. And as we started our journey somewhere back during COVID, uh, when there was a lot of emphasis on promoting the healthy hygiene behavior. And we started with how the health and wellness center can be equipped and also how the community can be built, uh, can be empowered on the information and knowledge related to the healthy hygiene behavior. And then we started our journey on the water testing. And the water journey started with the testing on the um, kind of a fecal contamination. That was uh, one of the mandatory tests which the health and wellness center has to do. And while the test was performed, it was also important to how they can collaborate with the PhD department, the Jal Jeevan mission and other department working on it. Slowly and gradually with our journey, we realized that uh, there is a uh, dearth of knowledge and understanding on other pollutant which is uh, impacting the uh, water health and uh, ultimately leading uh, impacting the human health and these pollutants are basically um, uh, context of the heavy metal so i will be sharing this piece of work a bit on the information on what is the heavy metal and focusing more on the lead and arsenic uh, there are many heavy metal but uh, i don't think that time will permit to talk on each on every component so i have chosen two components the lead and the arsenic and how it is um, affecting our health, what are the health impact, uh, what can be the mitigation uh, measures which can be taken for addressing to, uh, to these heavy elements. Uh, so coming to the pollutant thing. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, as we all know that the emerging pollutant in water, when we say it, we refer to the chemical and other substance which are increasingly common in our water sources. And when we say the emerging pollutant in water sources, it includes the uh, existence of the uh, pharmaceuticals, pesticide, personal care product, laundry deter uh, detergent, disinfectant, and industrial wash. And when we look at how it is impacting, if you look at the uh, picture and the slide, you will see that it reaches through the soil, it reaches through the water, it reaches to the uh, through the air on the human health. And when we also, because we are in a close contact with the plants, animals, microorganisms, they are also the carrier of these things. And these pollutants are... Uh, reaching to our body, infecting the different part of our body and imp impacting the overall, yeah. overall health yeah. and development of the human being. Hmm? Excuse me, everybody is requested to please mute themselves. Uh, I'm unable to mute you. Uh, sorry, Pallavi, just a second. No, no, no issues. All participants are requested to mute themselves. I see a name, Lavinia, if you may please mute yourself. Uh, I think rest of the people are muted. Uh, Sachin M. Sangama, please mute yourself and yeah, be a good to go. Over to you, Pallavi. Yeah, so coming back to the heavy metal and uh, the way uh, the heavy metal are described at 
the heavy metal are already there in the uh, naturally they are the element which are there in the soil but if you have like a exceeding percentage of uh, heavy metal in some water source or the food or the soil we uh, soil so that lead to the excessive concentration and that also lead to impact the environment as a whole and the human health and when we talk about the uh, metal the metal like lead arsenic mercury which occur na uh, naturally but the process and imp the what is important in heavy metal is the how we dispose waste and when we don't pay an attention or proper disposal of weight that leads to significant increase in their presence in terms of air water and soil and high because they contain the high degree of toxicity and the metal uh, that impact the public health and because of it has a higher uh, impact on the human health these are the of the public concern public health concern elements and when we go to the measure uh, heavy metal uh, which can also lead to the serious health risk both to the aquatic and the human life and when we look at this picture the uh, uh, although we know that the heavy metal impact us but if you look at the chart given there it impact the overall body of it 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 can impact the lungs it can impact the stomach it can impact the kidney it can also lead to alzheimer so these part are uh, this uh, heavy metal particle may not be discussed or not be taken so seriously but when we look at the impact it's uh, have a very uh, kind of a, it has it, it's impact badly on the human health and it can impact any of the body organ or the nerves of the human uh, coming to the lead exposure, um, I know the lead is very newer topic and when we started our uh, entire intervention on our lead, uh, one thing I would like to express here that even as a community, we have a very little information about the lead exposure and I think it has been just a year that some of the discussion has started at the national level and at the international level and icmr has also done one study which uh, also exposed that uh, some of the geographies of the indias are highly exposed to lead contamination and if you look at the data uh, out of 38 state and ut 23 states have high exposure of lead contamination in water sources in india and how we know that the, uh, there is a lead contamination so we test do a blood testing and if the blood test level comes uh, like concerning average should be 4.9 uh, microgram per deciliter in children under two liter uh, under two years but if we look at the what is the um, minimum value which is safest is 0 0.1 uh, uh, microgram per decimeter so if you look, uh, look at the level in the current it shows that 4.9 which is much much higher than what is recommended and which is the approved level by the uh, who and when we look at the vulnerability uh, lead is uh, uh, mostly the vulnerable population when we talk about the lead is the children and approximately uh, 2. Uh, 275 million children in india have elevated blood lead level so this give a high indication that the quantum of the health burden which has which is impacting due to the lead exposure and unfortunately none of us and most of us i will not say none of us but most of us are not exposed to it and we don't have a very little information on, on the lead exposure and how it is reaching to our blood level how it is uh, impacting the health of the children and if we look at this arsenic thing um i think girjaji talk about the uh, ganga river basin and if you like all these basin are highly uh, areas who, who have the high level of arsenic content in the water sources and if you look at uh, up to 4730 microgram per liter in ground litter which exceed much much beyond the who standard which is 10 microgram per liter uh, so this is the kind of the burden we have in terms of the arsenic and when we look at the vulnerable population over 100 million people are at at this point of time are at risk in India because of the arsenic contamination. 
And if we look at the sources uh, uh, about the lead and the arsenic, uh, mostly the lead is through the contaminated water, uh, which uh, because earlier we used to have the pipes and which is coated by the lead. So lead pipes are the uh, uh, kind of a, a source of uh, contamination of lead in the water. Uh, paint, the paint we generally use at home has a light, uh, has a heavy uh, concentration of lead in it. Uh, industrial immersion and some consumer product. If you look at the cosmetics, cosmetics is one of the most of the cosmetic products have the lead contamination. And uh, nowadays we also know that some of the eatable items also has the lead contamination. So it's coming in every way. It's not just like we are exposed only through the water, but we are also exposed through the paint, through the uh, consumer product, uh, through the cosmetics and other impact. And how it is impacted if you look at the list, it uh, impacts the neuro uh, neurological growth. Uh, it also uh, uh, inter interferes with the hemoglobin synthesis leading to anemia, which is one of the chronic issue when you look at the anemia diet data and particularly in the children women and adolescent uh, india is the highest burden of the anemia in uh, anemia so uh, lead is also contributing to it uh, when you look at the uh, lead uh, it also affect the kidney it uh, reduces the renal function uh, it also has the linkages with the hypertension and increased risk of heart and if you look at the reproductive thing it can also reduce fertility adverse pregnancy outcome and also one of the biggest uh, thing what we see in the children is the development de defects and delay which is one of the biggest contribution of the lead infection. So now we can understand the quantum of uh, issue we have and how this is impacting the overall health of uh, children particularly. When it comes to arsenic, again, it is contaminated through drinking water uh, because a lot of industrial pollution uh, pollutant are being mixed with the water sources. There are certain food. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of pesticides which are being used. So everything is washed down to the water level and that flows back in our drinking water. If we look at the health impact, again, uh, most of the health, health impact have the same as the lead. But if we look at Particularly, if we uh, go in the field, we see a lot of skin uh, lesion, hyperpigmentation. And uh, so those kind of uh, things is also because of the uh, arsenic presence. Uh, it also lead to the risk of cardiovascular disease. It lead to uh, neuropathy and uh, conservative defects. It also increases the risk of lungs cancer and respiratory cancer. Because nowadays, uh, we see that uh, more of more India, we are getting a more more number of cancer um, patient so uh, these are all uh, tools are also impacting the cancer burden of um, in the india and uh, if the long term exposure is also associated with as i mentioned uh, cancer of the skin uh, skin lungs bladder and the liver so if you look the overall impact it's not uh, it's very significant impact on the health so while we are working on the mitigating the health impact we have to also uh, look at how we can mitigate the risk of uh, <laughs> sorry this these contamination in the water sources so coming to the mitigation so when we talk about the mitigation of lead uh, the short term solution can be uh, these are some of the probable solution i'm not saying this is the entire thing what we have put it here it's just a kind of some of the uh, <coughs> solution we are putting replacing lead pipe using a certified water filter there are certain type of filter which say that they can they have the ability to refine the water from the lead and uh, presence of heavy metal contamination so if we look at the long term solution industrial regulation i think uh, girja ji also talked about it industrial regulation and management of electric waste is one of the important aspects that need to be fa factor and last and but not the least the community action because the community recently we were also uh, looking at uh, developing one social and behavior change around lead and uh, other heavy metal contamination and uh, to our surprise when we reached out to the community we reached out to the policy makers when we reached out to the implementer we noticed that there was a 
dearth of information hardly anybody knew that uh, lead is, is a serious concern and when we had this discussion with a lot of the implementer they said the first thing which they said that no there is no uh, lead contamination here but unfortunately lead is there in the water there in the soil there in the food we eat but somehow we need to bring this awareness uh, and also tell the community that lead is a problem and how we can also look at the um, how it is impacting the health of the children and when they are come encountering such kind of a health impact on the children they also need to get it tested for a, a lead contamination in the blood so that is another thing an awareness need to be raised when it come to the arsenic uh, identification of the water sources and safe drinking water filters can be a short term so you have to find out if some water sources is contaminated uh, by arsenic, the first and the foremost measure is to find an alternative source of water. And uh, long-term solution is water uh, testing, groundwater treatment, and a lot of policy intervention. And again, uh, arsenic is something which people know, but they have not started taking it seriously. And I think we need to build a lot of awareness around arsenic and lead uh, when it's come to the community, the uh, implementer, and the policy makers. And, uh, Going beyond this lead and uh, arsenic, if you look at the larger mitigation of the heavy metal contamination, I think the regular water testing we should be promoting and it should be a part of all the health initiative, all the initiative which is being done under the different ministry working for the uh, health and um, other social determinant of health and uh, uh, for example water and sanitation we need to educate public about the risk of lead exposure and provide guidance on the step that can be done to reduce exposure not only at the community level but also at the policy level and at the industry level because some of the effect the larger audience has to take it can't be taken at the household level we need to uh have the alternative water sources, develop and promote use of alternative water sources such as rainwater harvesting, pipe water supply, treated water surface. So they should be a part of mitigation problem uh, processes. Regulatory standard and monitoring. We need to have strict uh, restricted regulation standard uh, regarding the contamination level in the water and also ensure monitoring and the compliance. Uh, when it comes to the next step, the testing and lab labeling. So test water sources. There should be a process. There should be a micro plan that uh, whatever the water sources that need to be tested on a periodic basis and also the water sources which are tested and they are not safe for use, they should be properly labeled. And also uh, our guidance should be going to the community on the water uses. So these are the few five, th uh, four, five things which need to be done. Uh, last but not the least, uh, least uh, is the research and development. We need to invest more in the research, uh, uh, research to develop innovative water treatment technology. Because when we looked at the lead, uh, there is a very limited understanding of how we're going to do the water testing, uh, whom to contact about the water testing, what can be the alternative source of water. So those kind of uh, uh, research and development work has to done in terms of detecting and removing removing lead and arsenic from the water sources. Uh, coming to the primary healthcare, because our project is mostly on the primary healthcare, and we all know that the primary healthcare is the backbone of the health system. It's very important to have the screening and the prevention at Ayushman Aryogya Mandir, which earlier used to be known as the Health and Wellness Center. Uh, because health and wellness center are closest to the community, it's also the responsibility of the health and wellness center together with the community with, to raise awareness uh, about it and the promotion of the healthy hygiene behavior. And because uh, this problem cannot be solved in isolation, they need to have collaboration and partnership within the different uh, department, different government scheme, different mechanisms which are working at the grassroots level and at the policy level, at the intervention to mitigate this.
In terms of the policy uh, recommendation, again, we need to have more intersectoral collaboration between the health, water, environment, and education sector. We do need to have uh, strict monitoring and regulation when it comes to contamination and re uh, reinforcing or enforcing standard. And community involvement, when we design any program, it's very important to make the community aware about the issue and also to work with the community to find out the solution if that is applicable at the community level or to co-create solution with them. So localized intervention, st uh, stakeholder engagement is one of the crucial uh, policy recommendation for mitigating the risk of lead and heavy metal contamination. So uh, through this presentation, I wanted to uh, bring the issue of lead and arsenic contamination, what's need to be done, what are the mitigation things and how we as an advocate for water for change, uh, we while we are discussing on the other aspect, it's also important to bring the aspect of the heavy metal contamination in the water sources. So that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Pallavi. Thanks a lot to enlighten us with only two metals, by the way, <laughs> which is already scary for me because as you rightly mentioned there are more metal contaminants but uh, you just focused on only two of them so thanks for uh, for this uh, wonderful session and very simply explained just like uh, what Gija did and uh, the way I had requested both of you to bring this difficult science in a very simple manner to all of us here so let me now invite our uh, guest uh, of, as a discussant the final guest of the day uh, and again, I'm going to have really difficult time uh, uh, pronouncing his name, but I'll <laughs> keep it as Nathaniel or Nuts because I know him from before. So I can take the liberty to call him Nuts, but a wonderful friend. He's currently working with Mugama as a senior research scientist. His expertise is in water resources management, river basin management, and he's a policy expert in environmental pollution, waste management. He does a lot of capacity building and other works. And I see he's also interested in Miyawaki Forest and he does a lot of technical writing. He has worked on safe reuse of treated water in India, focusing on it on the business model side of it, recommending and development of compendium, synthesizing city climate plans uh, under the accelerating climate action through promotion of urban low emission development strategies and many other projects as uh, like other speakers i'm going to keep it short again uh, to invite you nuts to really engage both our speakers as well as our participants to really decode a little bit further what we are talking today on emerging pollutants over to you thank you so much dr mansi uh, i'll start with a summary of the first presentation by dr girija the presentation was titled uh, persistent organic pollutants Sources, health impacts, and its management. So, like uh, persistent organic pollutants or POPs, these are the pollutants that re resist degradation and accumulate in living organisms, causing harm to the environment, wildlife, as well as human health. They can also travel long distances through air, water currents, affecting locations far from their origin. The effects of POPs is the fact that they bioaccumulate in organisms that can lead to health issues such as cancer, reproductive disorders, immune system disruptions, as well as neurological uh, disorders. Uh, they, imp they, uh, they impart wildlife by causing reproductive impairments, such as uh, the pinning of eggshells in birds, which was mentioned. And the time of exposure is a key driver for different types of impacts with regards to uh, POPs. Uh, switching over to PFAS, which are also known as forever chemicals, which can also have several impacts on health, but currently we are unmindful of PFAS in the surroundings. The risk here as well depends on uh, the dose, frequency, route, and duration. Uh, there was a case study on the Ganga River Basin, which uh, highlighted the presence of POPs like PFAS in water, which also impacted the groundwater quality. And there is also a need for coherent systems for data collection as well as analysis to manage the pollution effectively. Uh, interestingly, as a glaciologist, these were also found on glacier systems, uh, which is quite scary, but then uh, they were found higher downstream, 
PFAS is found higher downstream than uh, upstream. Uh, moving on to the Innopol project, which focused in on the fluxes of plastics and microplastics as well as POPs uh, in, in various biota. Uh, then we all, the, it was uh, through the project, uh, samples in air, soil, sediments, cow's milk, fish around the Tapi and Dam, Damanganga rivers were, uh, were tested and identified the presence of various POPs, which are prohibited from the Stockholm Convention. So this project also helped uh, uh, help support the informal wastewater uh, waste workers in Surat and Bapi, as well as provided various insights to the Indian authorities to enhance the quality of life. Uh, the knowledge also is aiding the Indian government, uh, the central as well as state, with science improved uh, informed policy decisions as well as in preparing for international negotiations on plastic and pops pollution. Um, I will switch over to the other presentation, some the presentation by Ms. Pallavi Kumar, which was on emerging pollutants in water sources and their effect on health. Uh, and they are looking at, transform, at uh, transformative change and providing healthcare, comprehensive healthcare in India. And this is part of the findings that they found through their project Nishta. So uh, uh, regarding emerging pollutants, these are chemical com and compounds that have been recently identified as dangerous to environment and consequently to the health of human beings. With regards to heavy metals, they are a group of metals and metalloids with relatively high densities, some of which are even uh, toxic at PPB levels. Uh, the major heavy metals like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, and lead can enter water sources through industrial waste, mining activities, as well as improper disposal of hazardous materials. The lead com contamination sources include lead pipes, electronic waste, contaminated soil, with concerning levels uh, particularly affecting children. Uh, while there is very less information on lead ex exposure in India, Short-term exposure can lead to abdominal pain and fat fatigue, while long-term exposure can cause developmental disease, uh, nervous system damage, uh, renal function impairment, hemoglobin synthesis, which contributes to the anemia problem that is quite prevalent in India, uh, as well as, uh, uh, and this uh, particularly is, uh, affects young children. The uh, mitigation strategies include replacing lead pipes using certified water filters, implementing uh, industrial regulation, managing e-waste, and community actions like public ed education, blood level testing, as well as water testing. Uh, there was discussion with also regarding the presence of arsenic, especially in areas like the Ganga River Basin, which pose risks like skin lesions, as well as cardiovascular diseases. Short-term exposure uh, causes skin lesions as well as stomach pain, while long-term can even lead to uh, lung, bladder, liver, skin cancer, and neurotoxicity. Uh, with regards to mitigating the risk for arsenic, there is a need to identify uh, safe water sources, uh, provide safe water, safe drinking water, the use of appropriate filters as well, as well as implementing policy interventions including community awareness and screening com campaigns. Uh, there is also a call to promote uh, water testing as well as labeling of safe water resources. And the uh, primary health centers and Ayushman Arogya Mandis also play a crucial role in screening prevention and community engagement in the healthcare and hygiene cent center. With regards to the policy recommendations, there is an emphasis on intersectoral collaboration, particularly the health, water, environment, and education sector. There is a call for more monitoring and regulation of con contaminants and community involvement in co-created localized interventions. Uh, I just want to check if there is any questions in the chat box, in case right if you now, have any no. questions. Right yeah. now, no, you may please go ahead and put your questions. So I'll put the first question to Dr. Girija. 
Um, you mentioned that uh, there is a very high transboundary nature of persistent organic pollutants, as well as long range transport. So what kind of international cooperation and coordination would be necessary to effectively manage these pollutants across these vast distances? <clears throat> Thanks, Nathaniel, for asking that question. Uh, the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants, this was adopted and opened for ratification in 2001 and came into force in 2004. And uh, nearly a decade after the call for global action on POPs by the United Nations Environment Program in 1995. And this convention, it sought to prohibit or limit the use, production and release of selected chemicals, including polychlorinated biphenyls, dioxin, furans, and a range of other pesticides. So when it came into existence, it had banned or limited 12 persistent organic pollutants. And the list keeps on increasing. There is a very strong review committee, POPs review committee, which considers each chemical one by one before it comes into use. And they ban it or restrict it to use its use. As you know, DDT is part of the persistent organic pollutants and very, very strong pesticide, very effective pesticide. But some countries, including India, have got uh, an exemption because of because of its multi-purpose use for malaria control, vector control. So Stockholm Convention is the global treat convention which restricts, bans, or limits use of these POPs. And as I mentioned, the list keeps increasing and it has now come to 34. And with each COP, it is discussed and several of these chemicals become banned or restricted for use. So this is the global. In India, we have this national implementation plan. We are also signatories of Stockholm Convention. And we have this national implementation plan of how do we implement it? In uh, we had this NIP in 2000, uh, sorry, 11. Later, now the new NIP is also in force. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would like to ask the second question to uh, Ms. Pallavi. Uh, like, I'm particularly interested in how the public health uh, centers can uh, help reduce the impact of heavy metals in um, uh, on health. If you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, uh, so thank you, uh, Nav. Uh, so as I mentioned that the primary health care can be a game changer when it comes to the lead and other heavy metal contamination. Uh, because when we looked at uh, the first thing is looking at the sign and symptoms. And when I said about the lead contamination and the lead infection, uh, mostly it can be seen in the children with the development delays. So that is one of the area where they can identify that there is a presence of lead and uh, it's affecting the overall health of the children and the human. And the other thing is through the water source testing, because one of the mandate uh, work of the primary health care is also to do the water testing and also converge with the other department. And when we say that the primary health care, the Panchayati Raj institution, uh, the Jal Jeevan uh, mission, everybody has a key role to play with the primary health care. So uh, the primary health care can work to bring together all these partners to take a stock, do the testing, and also uh, getting it tested at the higher facility. Because when we said about the lead, lead testing cannot be done at the community level. The sample has to mm -hmm. be uh, sent to the district laboratories. So in terms of... Uh, 
that linkages can be drawn from the primary health care. And the biggest thing is like to spread the awareness around the lead and the heavy metal contamination because uh, there is a very little understanding about the these kind of a contamination at the community level. And for example, uh, when I said about the lead, uh, it's also coming from the food we eat, uh, the product we are consuming. So maybe a very specific uh, intervention is required in terms of spreading the information about it. So one is the uh, knowledge sharing, spreading the information, water testing, uh, keeping a track on the only sign and symptoms of um, lead and the arsenic things, and also bringing the different partners and player to act on it. So. Uh, through these uh, methods, the primary healthcare uh, can work on mitigating the risk of lead and other heavy metal contamination. Yeah. Thank you very much. I see that we barely have four minutes left. So I would like to turn this over to Manthi. Please continue. No, no, I think, ah. Nathaniel, please go ahead and continue. We also have some questions in the chat box now. And you may also continue with a few more questions. Uh, go ahead. Ah, there is a there is a question from Tuhin Banerjee for Pallavi. It's great to know that there are now some awareness about lead and arsenic. Also, it is known that there are various technologies for its removal. But why do you think that greater adoption of such filters isn't seen in affected areas? And do you think that a scientific study would help to decide where the government funded filters are installed? for greater adoption amongst the public so that government funds aren't wasted to install filters where it's not required? No pertinent question. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a very specific thing. Uh, and regarding the filters, I know there are certain type of filter can uh, filter the heavy metal contamination in the water. Uh, but um, in terms of its implementation, uh, I know the government has been thinking, but I, I uh, I'm not very clear, so I will not say whether it is being implemented or not. But in our intervention places, we have not seen these kind of a filter you being used at the community level. So unless and until it's only uh, unless and until it is deployed, used, the effectiveness of those things it will be very difficult to establish. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is another question. Uh, for you, Pallavi, from Sonia. Can you envision any alignment between training five women under the Jal Jeevan mission to conduct water testing for lead uh, for lead and heavy metal contamination yeah. and integrating these skills into functions of PHC? Yeah. So, uh, uh, Sonia, you raised a very interesting thing under the Jal Jeevan mission. At every gram, uh, I think every village, five women are being trained on the water testing. They are called Jal Saya, if I'm not wrong. And they have uh, been given a kit, uh, uh, which there is a 12 kind of a testing. But unfortunately, lead is not there. So maybe uh, an advanced kind of a kit is required, uh, which can test the lead contamination. And then these women can be trained on that. But as of now, there is no kind of a uh, kit available for testing lead contamination when it comes to Jaljeevan mission or the women trained under the Jaljeevan mission. So there is a gap area in this. Thank you so much. Um, I have another uh, another question for Dr. Grija. Um, like, uh, with regards to the specific sources and pathways of PFAS contamination observed in the Ganga, Ganga River Basin, what measures could actually be taken to address this issue? Thanks, Nats. You know, the sources of PFAS is varied, uh, starting from firefighting foam. And um, unfortunately, it is so, it is not a point source, it's a non point source. And in many industrial applications, also PFAS has found is there. And uh, textiles, carpets, furnishings, clothing, cosmetics, food packaging. There are several aspects where PFAS is 
there. And some other uses where PFAS is used is uh, solvents like oil, water repellents in packaging, leveling agents in paints, etc., ink, adhesive. So first is regulatory governance. It's very important to prohibit, prevent, ban these forever chemicals so that it doesn't even enter the ecosystem. So once it has already entered the ecosystem, we will have to do only retrospective management of it. So first of all, prevent it from entering because there are several studies which are going on in parallel to see what are the alternative, what are the safe alternatives of these chemicals. Yeah. It has also been found in food packaging, etc., cosmetic products. From many of the cosmetic products, it has been removed or banned. Did I answer you? Uh, yes, yes, yes. We have another question from Sachin Sangma. Uh, I think this is for you, Dr. Girja. How can we prevent contamination of microplastic in water? Since we have been using plastic water bottle that contain microplastics and we are using it for more than a decade. <clears throat> is there any treatment taken by the government to control this? Yeah, that's a very good and interesting question. And we are all <laughs> talking about plastic waste management, microplastic etc and there is increasing interest seen because we have seen microplastics everywhere we have seen microplastic in salt we have seen microplastic in human blood and several other tasks the first and foremost is banning plastic banning plastic means reducing its usage and we are also mindful about the micron size of the plastic which we are using so that it doesn't disintegrate into microplastics. Once it becomes microplastic, it's very difficult to manage it. So the first and foremost step is to reduce or ban usage of plastic so that it doesn't come into the environment and disintegrate into microplastics. So manage it as a macroplastic so that you don't have to grapple with the issue of managing microplastic. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mansi, do we have more time? Yeah, Sunil, the conversation is so interesting. I really don't wish to end, but uh, I will still give you some more time. Please go ahead and have some more questions. Even I have my questions, you know, but I would like you to take more questions if you would like to. Yeah. We don't have more any more questions in the chat box. Not in the chat box, but do you have any question or... I asked some questions. But please, please go ahead, Dr. Manchi. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Nathalie. So are you done with your questions or I come back to you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So so uh, stay around because uh, who knows if I have a question for you only because you are youth representative here. So, uh, Girja, you are aware that I am also working on this uh, uh, Ganga plastic pollution project where we are looking at the behavioral side of it, you know, going out uh, to people and asking, and you rightly mentioned that uh, the prevention is equally important. I mean, one thing is really working on its, uh, you know, solutions as both of you have and Pallavi uh, laid out a very social uh, and governance approach of mitigation. And I'm sure both of you have been also working on the technical side of its mitigation or mechanical sides of its mitigation. Uh, but my question being more of a governance scholar is when we all know these pollutants are there, I'm talking about the conventional pollutants, and we are still unable to manage them. And I rightly mentioned arsenic is still known among the people. You know, just to give an example. Plastic is known among the people. I would like to ask both of you the same question. Uh, based on your field experiences, uh, what kind of, uh, you know, behavioral ch change you think people will bring? So what kind of dose they require, you know, like health is a very good indicator, as Pallavi rightly mentioned, ki wo jo fear factor hai na, that may work, you know, 
but other than that, have you experienced any other things that uh, people can be really talking about? And I am saying this with respect to if Corona like something is waterborne, which is invading. Do you think people will change their behavior uh, immediately, just like they did in the airborne corona? <laughs> because I see emerging pollutants as no different than corona, you know, because we are unaware about it. So maybe some uh, great, great uh, emerging pollutant comes in and I really feel scared about it, to be honest. Uh, so I would like to comment here first. Uh, so it's a very difficult to answer question when it comes to the behavioral change. And we have all been struggling as a social scientist, social development sector. We know that how it's difficult to change the behavior. And uh, unless and until uh, uh, you cited about the example of Corona. So unless and until the Corona didn't translate it into the death that the fear has not generated. So similarly, uh, uh, the way I said, and you also mentioned that the linkaging with the health thing, health impacting the health. So I think we are, uh, as a society, is trained in a way that we only look at the larger outcome. We don't look at the processes and how it's impacting the everyday life around us. So I think it's very important to tell the uh, community. And most of the time, we... Uh, pitch to a community uh, from a very outsider perspective. I think what's very important for us to bring the behavior change is to sit with the community, understand, co-create the solution and let them also be a part of the team uh, to what the action which is needed at the community and how these action can be further supervised, monitored, handhold by the community itself. Because what we have seen is unless and until we don't uh, make the community a part of the entire implementation and the designing process, it's become very difficult. And same is also applicable for the behavior. It needs to come from them, sit with them, ask them, make them also understand and realize them. Sometimes it's very important to make them see the problem. Just talking about the problem will not lead into anything. Also link them with the real evidence or the real incidents, what is happening around them. Because most of the cases, if you're saying, okay, uh, it leads to a certain percentage of death, that may be slightly meaningless for them unless and until they see someone dying nearby. So how mm -hmm. if you identify a children with the development delays, if you have some understanding that in some uh women or the children or the men have a higher percentage of lead contamination and how it's impacting their health. So kind of a visually connecting with them will also lead to uh, uh, understand them better about the consequences and how this is impact going to impact the overall health of the community and how they can together contribute to address this. So unless and until we don't plan in a way, it will be very, very difficult to actually talk about the behavior change not only talking leading the behavior to be changed so this is my take on so this very well put very well put and actually you nailed it uh, in a way uh, that we are uh, submissive to a uh, slow poisoning in a way when we introduced fertilizer we were already accepting slow poison to come in, on in our lives and uh, that way, uh, even, you know, because we are also so, uh, I will say, we, uh, we run by belief system. So many a times when children uh, are, uh, you know, some uh, retarded or we are also fatigued and all kinds of illness we face, we, uh, we tend to uh, go spiritual or religious about it and not really look at the technical aspect of it. And probably a scientist can look at the uh, scientific aspect of it because they are seeing a pattern. But if I'm looking at it in my own house, I see, oh, Bhagwan ki marji or some marji or, you know, something you have done, some pap. And we hide behind uh, or not hide, but we pretend to not know these uh, facts that there is something which is happening, uh, which is uh, scientifically proven now. So I think knowledge and is important and conversation is important. Very rightly put, co-learning or co-creating the solution is extremely important. Very much a governance approach. Girja, uh, if there is something like water-born uh, corona coming through these emerging pollutants, it is very scary and 
I mean, I feel like going back to referring to dinosaurs and all kinds of civilizations which went, uh, which, which disappeared, which went extinct. So uh, should we be scared of something? I mean, I know I'm posing a very big question, but why not? You know? Yeah. Um, thanks These are ghosts. Time. Emerging pollutants are ghosts. Uh, emerging pollutants are silent killers. I would rather yes, say it. Slow, right. slow death. We are dying slow yeah. death. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So I was uh, listening to Pallavi's uh, points and few, just few more points. I thought I'll put it across uh, in addition to the ones. Health is a very important indicator. Similarly, cost is also a very important indicator. Absolutely. If we have an alternative, which is cost effective for general masses, people will definitely go for it. So cost mm -hmm. is a definite driver. So if we have these subsidies, so the larger regulatory framework needs to have incentive and incentivize green chemistry so that adoption of these alternate, safer alternatives is much more. And uh, we unfortunately have seen in the case of CFCs, when the phasing of CFCs was done, the alternative HCFCs FCFCs was much more costly. So people didn't prefer to go for it. But if there is an incentive for cost reduction, mm -hmm. many times the, the green alternative is much more costlier than the original product. Mm -hmm. And the original product, like as I mentioned, DDT is much more effective than its alternatives. So we have to find ways besides mm -hmm. the community engagement it is important. Health impact is important. But then people, if they don't see immediate health impact, they don't pay heed to it. So cost is something which drives them. We have to be very mindful and have to have ways of incentivizing or de-incentivizing in these aspects. Yes. There's a very good comment. Uh, thank you, Girja. And thanks, Pallav. There's a very good comment which has come into the chat box and uh, and I uh, somehow echo with you to uh, to him. Uh, somewhere a state has to also take responsibility of these things. You know, after all, health and education at large is any state's responsibility, and it is a fundamental right of every citizen to ask for it. And yes. if if if, um, if the scientists are struggling to really find solutions for these uh, invisible. Uh, monsters, I must say, not ghosts anymore after learning from both of you. I, I see a more helplessness amongst uh, uh, common citizens to really address the issue, uh, apart from uh, really working towards co-creating or uh, bringing behavioral change. But this is like a chicken and egg situation when we talk about behavioral change. And then how much we are investing in research and development, how much we are investing in healthcare, how much we are investing in uh, knowledge and awareness on these things will also matter in the long run. And that will require altogether a different session discussion that are we investing enough on water epidemics? I have been really trying to find people to run a series on water epidemics, but uh, not to your, both of your surprise and even not surprise that we actually do not have much education um, facilitated in the country on water epidemics. Because the medical education talks about, uh, you know, cure. There is no education on prevention. And that's where I think we have to really have an absolutely new discourse on water epidemics here. I invite all the participants, if you know somebody, if you are interested to talk about water epidemics, I am very keen to really run a series, at least four, five, six sessions on water epidemics only to really have a repository of knowledge here. I myself run a course on water epidemics, but I'm really talking about at a very surface level and not going in depth. But then that can also, you know, you can be used as a starting point. We can go on talking about it, but I'm sure Girja and Pallavi and Nats, you are going to get us more discussion uh, on this and get more speakers to discuss all other heavy metals, which we have not discussed today. <laughs> because, you know, we need to know if, and, you know, knowing also will help to uh, find out alternate solutions, as both of you have mentioned. Because if not knowing, then solutions are not coming. So understanding and knowing the problem is the foremost thing which we have to really work towards as uh, water workers, as I say, all of us, we are. 
So with these lines, I think it's a good time for me to uh, extend the vote of thanks and call the session off for today. So thank you so much, uh, first of all, to all the participants here in Zoom and on YouTube for being part of Wednesdays for Water for so many sessions. We have crossed 250 sessions, as you know, including all the Wednesday, Friday and Monday sessions. And we are going great. At least I have um, confirmation until July end, so I can promise until that, then that we are going. And we take these baby steps of one or two months so that we know we are um, running the show. We thank you for your support and encouragement to make these water conversations meaningful because it's extremely important, as I mentioned in the beginning, for us, conversation is the key step to conservation of water and many other things, allied activities, as we just talked about it. We shall continue with our Wednesdays for Water session and the more Wednesdays to come. But for now, next week, let me just announce you the next week, June 5th, um, which is Wednesday at 5 p.m. IST. Do join us for a discussion where Gurujal is starting a series on nature-based solutions. And the first of the series is about understanding nature-based solutions and its application in India. The joining link is also put in the chat box and it is going to be flashed in our websites. And next Monday, and Monday is dedicated to um, Ma or Women for us. So Monday, Munching and Musing with Women for Water to acknowledge and appreciate their water endeavors on June 3rd, which is before the Wednesday. At 5 p.m. IST, we are having members of the South Asia Young Women in Water, which is a new platform now uh, to join us and talk about their endeavors. And we have people from three different countries, and Meghna Chakravarti, Monzima Haq, and Tabir Riyas. And they are going to share their little water journey they have and what kind of mentorship they are seeking from the larger water community in the world. So the joining link is also put in the chat box and it is going to be flashed on our website and social media. So do keep checking our website www.w4w.in for regular updates and all our social medias are also available at w4w. So thanks again to all of you and do take care of yourself. I know at individual level we may not be able to address our water pollutants, all kinds of the conventional and the emerging, but definitely we can change our lifestyle and occupation towards it and look at it in a very different way and maybe embrace a life of essentialism and minimalism. That way we consume less and become we also become less carriers of pollutants. So thanks a lot, all of you. Please take care of yourself and we see each other very uh, soon. Bye-bye and take care.